X-rays are used in a wide variety of devices in the medical and security fields because they allow us to see the internal composition of some elements without having to open them or come into contact with them. That's why in this video we will see the functioning of the heart of this technology, the X-ray tubes. But first I want to thank PCBWay for sponsoring this video. PCBWay offers a wide range of PCB prototyping services, with the ability to respond to orders from 5 PCBs to several thousand, including assembly services and the manufacturing of custom plastic and metal pieces. Plus, if you are more experienced, you can participate in the 6th PCBWay Design Contest. Just upload your projects by January 15, 2024 and you can win up to $1,500 along with other exciting prizes, so go check out their website. To understand how an X-ray tube works, we first need to clarify what exactly X-rays are. They are a form of electromagnetic radiation, which means they are in the same category as light, radio waves, or even the Wi-Fi that reaches our phones. However, they have a much higher frequency and therefore higher energy, which gives them two important characteristics. Firstly, they have a high penetrating power, being able to pass easily through materials of a low density. Secondly, they have the ability to ionize some of the atoms and molecules with which they interact, affecting their original structure. Due to these characteristics, X-rays can be used to take radiographies in which our bones can be seen. But at the same time we must be careful not to expose ourselves to it too much so they don't generate cellular damage or genetic alterations in our body. Understanding this, an X-ray tube is a device capable of generating this electromagnetic radiation of high frequency and energy. The main way to achieve this is to generate what is known as breaking radiation. This type of radiation is generated by the deceleration or breaking of a charged particle, usually an electron, when it's deflected by the electric field of an ion or an atomic nucleus. When an electron is deflected, it changes its velocity. If we analyze this before and after the collision, we will see that its magnitude will not change much. However, velocity is a vector quantity, which is composed of magnitude and direction. When considering this second part, if we evaluate the components of the velocity before and after the collision, we will realize that the electron will increase its velocity in one of the components. In other words, the electron will be accelerating as a result of the collision. And how does this affect us exactly? When a charged particle such as an electron moves, it creates an electric field and a magnetic field around it. If this particle moves at constant velocity, the electric and magnetic fields it generates are also constant over time. However, if the particle changes its velocity, meaning it accelerates or decelerates, then the generated electric and magnetic fields also change, propagating outward and creating electromagnetic waves. Although it should be noted that for them to be in the X-ray spectrum, the collisions must occur at extremely high velocities. In addition to breaking radiation, there is a second process for generating X-rays known as characteristic radiation. Although this one generates only a small percentage of the X-rays emitted by the tube. In this case, if one of the accelerated electrons has enough energy, it can collide with an anode atom and eject some of the electrons in its inner shell, leaving an empty space there. As a result, an electron from a higher shell will fall to fill the space, emitting X-rays in the process. Since each element has a defined atomic structure, each time this happens, the amount of energy contained in the emitted X-rays will depend exclusively on the element with which the collision was generated, and the shell in which the ejected electron was found. In other words, each element will have its own radiation profile, allowing us to identify them by measuring the energy of the X-rays resulting from the collision with the electrons. This process is known as X-ray spectrography. Understanding this, we are ready to make our X-ray emitting tube. The first thing we will need is a vacuum-sealed container that will serve several essential functions. It will allow us to make sure that there are no other scattered elements in the path of the electrons that could cause them to collide and lose energy prematurely. In addition, the vacuum, as in incandescent lights, will protect some components from oxidation, which would reduce their useful life if exposed to high temperatures in the presence of air. Next, we will need a cathode and an anode, or in other words, a negatively charged electrode and a positively charged electrode. Since positive and negative charges attract each other, we might expect that free charges, or electrons, would move from the cathode to the anode. 
However, this will not happen naturally, as these components are physically separated. To effectively make the electrons move from the cathode to the anode, an effect known as thermionic emission is used. This effect tells us that if we have a negatively charged metal and we heat it, the electrons will acquire enough energy to escape from the surface. So, by integrating a filament that is heated to high temperatures right next to the cathode, we can generate a continuous flow of free electrons. These will be instantly attracted to the anode at the other end, being accelerated by the electric field between the two electrons. If you already know a bit about electronics, this probably reminds you of vacuum diodes, which basically have the same configuration, and the truth is, they are indeed almost the same. The main difference between these two components is the voltage. The production of X-rays requires that electrons are accelerated to high speeds, and for this to occur, X-ray tubes are designed to operate at much higher voltages. In a typical vacuum diode, the voltage ranges from a few volts to a few kilovolts. In contrast, X-ray tubes typically operate in the range of tens to hundreds of kilovolts. And while we're on the subject of voltage, you may be wondering what happens to current. While the voltage regulates the speed of the colliding electrons and thus the energy of the X-rays emitted, the current controls how many electrons are emitted by the cathode, and consequently the amount of X-rays that will be generated. Although the amount of current used will depend on the specific application, it usually ranges from a few milliamps to a few hundred milliamps. Up to this point we would have a fully functional X-ray tube. But there are still some design details that we should consider. As you can imagine from a system that collides particles at high velocities and operates at thousands of volts, temperature is also an issue, especially in the area where the collisions are generated. To solve this, the anode usually has a piece of tungsten that receives all the collisions. This material is used because it has a high melting point, about 3400 degrees Celsius. But not only that. It also has a high atomic number, which allows a much more efficient generation of X-rays than with other materials. If we recall the methods by which X-rays are generated, first of all, the breaking radiation depends on the deflection of electrons interacting with the electric field of an ion or an atomic nucleus. Since atoms with a higher atomic number have a higher positive charge on their nuclei, the electron deflection is stronger, and consequently the emitted electromagnetic radiation will have more energy. Moreover, if we focus on the characteristic radiation, it depends on the ejection of electrons from the inner shells of the atoms in the target. Because of this, materials of a higher atomic number, which have a higher number of electrons, have a higher probability that one of their electrons will be ejected and generate characteristic radiation as a result. Even with all these characteristics, tungsten can still reach problematic temperatures during X-ray generation, especially at high voltages and current intensities. This is why in some cases a rotating target is included so that the area impacted by the electrons is constantly changing, preventing temperatures from rising uncontrollably. Having solved the temperature problem, we still have one last problem, how to control the direction in which the X-rays are emitted. Since X-rays can be harmful to our health, their direction must be controlled as much as possible. If we analyze our tubes as they are now, the X-rays would be emitted in all directions. To solve this, the area where the electrons hit is usually inclined so that the X-rays are ejected in a specific direction, usually perpendicular to the path of the electrons. Furthermore, to make sure that the X-rays don't reach unwanted places, the tubes usually have a coating of some material such as lead which due to its high density and atomic number is ideal for stopping the X-rays. This cover is usually filled with oils, which help with heat dissipation, works as an electrical insulator and also absorbs a small part of the X-rays. Depending on the application in which the X-ray tube is used, several of these details may change, but with this you will have a solid basis for understanding how this device works. If you found this video interesting, I recommend you watch my video on how an ion thruster works. That's all for now and see you in the next video.